Welcome to Food BP Church, Top Sunday School. In this lesson, we are going to cover Acts chapter 3. Let us begin a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this day we thou has made, that we can come together to study thy word. And may thou be with us at this time to grant unto us our wisdom and understanding that we may be able to apply our word into our life. Thanks out to Lord of all our sins, and we commit all this with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thus far, what we have covered in Acts chapter 1, and also in Acts chapter 2, is that the apostles were told to wait for the Father's promise. And also the Great Commission was given in chapter 1. And how the apostles will receive power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the Great Commission. And after the giving of the Great Commission, the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven on Mount Olivet. And from the time of Christ's resurrection to his ascension was 40 days. Ten days after, the disciples celebrated the Feast of the Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost marked the inauguration of the Holy Spirit ministry on earth in a scale that is beyond our imagination. The church was born in Jerusalem, and that was the beginning of the church in the New Testament, whereby we have the blueprint of the spiritual life of the church that includes the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the administration of the Lord's Supper, and the ministry of prayer. And that's in chapter 2 that we have covered. And now we come to chapter 3. And the theme of our study in chapter 3 is on the lessons learned from the first miracle. It was the first miracle after the church was born in Jerusalem. And in this first miracle, it is important for us to have the right the right focus. It was like a camera. The one thing that we want to get out of a camera is a clear picture. In order to have a clear picture, the focus must be sharp. We do not want a blurring picture or a picture that is not clear at all. And so to get a good picture, the focus is important. With the right focus, we will definitely get a clear picture. And this is what we are going to see in Acts chapter 3 from the first miracle. And so may the Holy Spirit be our teacher. From verses 1 to 5, we see what is the wrong focus. And so let me read to you verses 1 to 5 of Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, Ask and arms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Now up to here. The ninth hour is 3 p.m. in the afternoon, according to the Jewish clock. And it was supposed to be the hour of prayer. The Jewish had their schedule of time for prayer. They prayed three times a day, first in the morning at 9 a.m., and then second at 12 noon, and then the last one at 3 p.m. Do you remember Daniel, how the Bible records he prayed three times a day? I believe it is the same here. And so Peter and John were going for their last prayer for the day at 3 p.m. in the temple. Many Jews will be there, and it was a good opportunity for them 
to share the gospel. And so I believe they went with preaching the gospel in their mind that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is going to be Peter's first miracle recorded in the Bible. And so in this passage, where the first miracle was recorded, out of so many beggars outside the temple, the focus was on this certain man in verse 2, who was lame from his mother's womb. He could not walk. He had to be carried. And so daily he was laid at the temple, or at the gate of the temple, called beautiful, to beg for arms. Now why did Luke tell us the name of the gate called beautiful? One reason is, I believe, because Luke was a very detailed man. He will not miss out any important detail. He wants to be as specific as possible. As in this case, the first miracle is about to happen. And it happened at this gate called Beautiful. And so this is the first reason. The second reason, I believe, is the word Beautiful. And this word beautiful in Greek means the right time. And so it implies that the time is right or the right time has come. The time for the first miracle to happen has come in particular for this certain man. Out of so many beggars at the gate, the right time has come for something great to happen to this lame man. Now this lame man, the, the name was not mentioned. His name was not given. He was begging at the gate. And he approached everyone who are going in the direction to the temple, hoping to get some sympathy from them. And that was the only purpose why he was there. And when Peter and John were standing before him, his eyes were still focusing on the people who passed, passed by. And until Peter has to say something to get his attention, we need to visualize a little bit how the whole situation was like. And so we look at this certain man. He was lying down at the side of the gate. Because he was lame, probably he was lying down on one side of his body because he could not sit up or stand. He could only lie down, maybe tilting his head about to look at the people who pass him. And Peter and John were standing before him, and yet he was not able to focus on them. Now, until Peter stopped him and said to him, Look on us. Focus. Look here. We are here. Only then he caught the lame man's attention. And he looked on them. He focused on them. And the Bible tells us in verse 5, and he gave it unto them, expecting to receive something of them. A beggar begging for money is normal, isn't it? Then even Peter knew that that is to be expected as he also revealed in verse 6, saying that silver and gold have I none. So it was money that the beggar was expecting, the lame man was expecting. Now this lame man represented the whole world. What is life? The God of this world, Satan, has convinced you and me that life is all about material things. Life is all about surviving. And how to survive? You need money to survive. You need money to get by. You need money to enjoy life. The more money you have, the better life you can go for. And so it is a very basic philosophy of obtaining wealth to survive. And even better, to enjoy a richer and fuller life. And that's the world for you. But God has a different plan. For you and me. That's why he sent Peter and John on a mission to fulfill a spiritual purpose. To come and to reach the people, the lost, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
so that they may be able to find the spiritual solution to their spiritual problem. And what is the spiritual problem? They have this spiritual problem which they have been ignoring. That's why the focus of the lame man was wrong. He was looking for materialism to solve his life problem. No doubt, with money, he will be able to live better. He will be able to survive. He did not have to go to sleep with an empty stomach. With money, he can, he can buy food. With money, he can buy clothes to keep him warm when he sleeps. And maybe one day he will have enough so that he will, he will not need to beg for money anymore. And so money seemed to be able to solve all his problems. And likewise, for the whole world, likewise for you and me, isn't it? Like the lame man, many are also focusing on their physical needs today. And that is the reason why they work hard and do whatever it takes to earn a better living. And so they prefer to focus on the physical needs above their spiritual needs. But it is the spiritual needs that are most important. Remember what Jesus said in Mark verse 36. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And so focusing on the physical needs above the spiritual need would be the wrong focus. From God's perspective, such a focus is wrong. And so what is the right focus? We want to know what is the solution to the problem that we are facing. And that is the problem of sin. And we need to have the right focus. Then we will have the right solution. And so the answer is given from verses 6 to 10. Let me read to you from verses 6 to 10. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he who sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Up to here. So Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Now, it does not mean that Peter is poor and therefore he has no money for any donation. Let us not always think about money. There are more important things than money. We need to get this right. We need to focus on the right thing. Now allow me to rephrase uh, Peter's words. And this is what he's saying. I have something far better than money to give you. I'm not going to give you money because money is not good enough. If money can buy salvation, how many could have entered heaven already? Unfortunately, no amount of money can earn you the way to heaven. No amount of money can pay for your sin. And this is what Peter is saying to the lame man. And what Peter is about to give to this lame man, it is something that money cannot buy. And so Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You think money can solve your life problem? I'm going to give you something more than that. I'm going to give you the gospel. I'm going to give you what this man Jesus Christ of Nazareth can do for you. Rise up and walk. 
Now, we must not jump to conclusion that miracles are more important than the gospel. Because what Peter has said in these few words reveal the accent of the gospel. Whose name did Peter use? It is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus means Savior. Christ means the Anointed One. And so the name itself is already the gospel. It is how God the Father sent God the Son. And this is his promise to send to his people the Savior to save them from their sin. Here is the anointed one. God has already promised his people in the Old Testament and how he will send to them the Messiah. But the Messiah is Hebrew and for Greek will be Christ. And so Christ means the anointed one. And so the name Jesus Christ is already the gospel that is known to the people. And of course, Peter did not stop here. It is only the beginning. Why didn't he share the gospel with the lame man before healing him? This tells us that miracles can happen to anyone. Now, whether one has faith or not, miracles can happen. In other words, this miracle show to us the very purpose. Because this miracle is done in the name of Jesus Christ. And to make it even clearer for the people, Peter purposely specified where did Jesus Christ came from. He is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is a place not where Jesus was born, but it is where he spent most of his childhood, as well as where he taught, he preached, and did many miracles there. He was known as his headquarters. And so therefore, all the people, including the lame man, knew who Jesus Christ of Nazareth was. And so when Peter used his name, the miracle became a sign that direct and point the power to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that was the whole purpose of the miracle. It served as a pointer. It definitely holds the attention of the people when this miracle was done. The focus was to directly point to Jesus Christ. And what happened next? There was a miracle. We read in verse 7, And Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. But well, we see how Luke was so meticulous, even mentioning his feet as well as his ankle bones, and how they received strength. They do not have strength on their own. This man was lame from birth. The strength came from external. And so it was a miracle. A miracle had been done on this man who has never walked before. And what did he do? Verse 8. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Well, we note how Luke recorded all the action that the lame man who was healed, you know, after he was healed, what did he do? He jumped. Okay? He jumped up. That's the word leap. He jumped up. And I think he never stood, never stand before. Now he is standing. He stood. And he walked. Never walked before, now he walked and entered with them into the temple. Never entered into the temple before, but now he entered together with Peter and John into the temple. Now from the medical point of view, it is impossible. All these things are impossible. 
all this action that we see from the lame man who is now healed perfectly, all these are impossible from the medical point of view. The leg may be there, but how to have the strength? There were no muscles to, to give strength to the leg. So it was clearly a miracle. And it was a complete one. Not only this man was able to start walking, jumping, which he had never done so in his entire life, since birth. He did not even need the necessary physiotherapy so to prepare him to learn how to walk, how to move his leg, how to stand, how to run, how to jump. All this movement involved exercising the muscle, stretching the nerves, the joints, everything put together at one instant by the word of Peter. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he was able to walk straight away. It was as if he had been walking all his life. Indeed, it was a miracle. And he entered into the temple for the first time. Well, the gate was probably the, the closest that he can get to the temple. Because he needed to be carried. Since he was lame, he must have seen countless of times how worshippers entered the temple. Probably hidden in his heart how he could also enter the temple and worship and praise God like everybody else. But because he was lame, if he wanted to enter the temple, he would need people to carry him inside, which is almost impossible. And so it could only remain a little wish, a little prayer in his heart. But by the grace and mercy of God, he was healed perfectly. After he was healed, he walked straight into the temple with Peter and John. And he started praising God in the temple. Because he was overwhelmed with joy, nothing could stop him. He walked, he jumped, and he praised God. Praise the Lord, isn't it? And what was done to him was witnessed by all who were present. You know, especially those who recognized this lame man who bat at the beautiful gate. And so the miracle that happened caught their attention. That like what was recorded here in verse 10. They were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. So the miracle was done with the right focus. It was focused on Christ and him alone. But did the people focus rightly? Unfortunately, they failed. They chose to focus on the miracle, which was a wrong focus. Remember, the miracle is only a sign. The purpose of the sign is to point to the main object or the main person. And so therefore, the problem is not the miracle. The problem is also not the miracle worker, Peter. The main problem for their wrong focus is their own spiritual blindness. And so from verses 11 to 12, we see how the people focus on the wrong thing. Verses 11 and 12, we read, And as the lame man which was healed, helped Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the pot that is called Solomon, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? Now, they are now gathering at this place called Solomon Pots. And this was located at the temple's outer court, 
which overlook a valley. And this port was not built by Solomon. The one built by Solomon was already destroyed by the Babylonian. And so the ports were rebuilt on the same spot and still bore Solomon's name. Now over at this place, the Solomon ports, well, it was recorded that the people began to follow Peter and John. Why? Because they saw the miracle. But why did they follow Peter and John? Well, because they wanted more. They wanted to see more miracles. They should have focused on Christ because the miracle was done in his name. The apostles were merely instruments whom God is pleased to perform this miracle. But the people focused wrongly. They focused on the miracle. They focus not on Christ. And Peter made it very clear to them that they are focused wrongly. They have no power at all to heal. There is no credit which Peter can claim because it was not done in his name. It was not done in his own power. He has no power at all. He is just an instrument. So we need to correct this wrong focus. Now today we are also seeing the same thing. How people are drawn to miracles. But can we blame them? Because who are using miracles as publicity to mislead the people? Is it not the charismatic? Come, come and see the miracle. Come, if you have any sickness, come and be healed. So people are being misled. So instead of correcting the people not to focus on the miracle, the charismatic use miracle to draw people into the church. And so they misled them to focus on miracles. So that when these people came and sought healing, you know, whatever problem they may, they may have, they may have their sicknesses, they may have their disabilities, and they came. They came to be healed. They came not because of the gospel, not because of God, not because of anything else, but they came because of the miracle. And then when they are not healed, what happened? The charismatic miracle workers blaming on their lack of faith. By coming is already a lot of faith. But what a way to hide their own deception and inability to heal by pushing the blame on the people's lack of faith. So they had misled the people to focus on miracles. But well, these people who came ought to be taught the truth and be given the gospel because their sicknesses and disabilities can never be more serious than their spiritual problem which is their bondage to sin. Sin is the greatest problem. And this problem of sin can only be solved using the right solution. Miracle is not a solution. The miracle points to the solution. If the problem of sin is not solved, so what if you have a healthy body? You will still end up in hell. And so it is the failure of the spiritual leaders that caused a stumbling block to those who are in need of salvation. Is it not the blind leading the blind? And so when Peter realized that the people had focused wrongly, he began his second sermon to point them to Jesus Christ. He did not perform another miracle to support the first miracle. No, he preached Christ. The first miracle ought to have shown to the people. The focus is Christ, not the miracle itself, not the miracle worker, but Christ and Him alone. That is the right focus. Well, from verses 13 to 18, we see the right focus. Okay, from verses 13 to 18, let me read to you. 
the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, who faith, in his name had made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him had given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot not, I wot that who ignorant ye did it, I did also your rulers. But those things which God had before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Lord, this is a second sermon by Peter. And the message was all about Christ because it is the way, the truth, and the life. Without him, there is no miracle. And so the right focus is Christ. Then some may say, why not do away with the miracle? Just preach Christ. The miracle is a sign. The miracle is not a distraction. The miracle is pointing. It's helping the people to look at Christ. The miracle authenticates the message which Peter is preaching to them. It proves that they have been sent by God to preach Christ and Him crucified. So don't blame the miracle. The miracle has fulfilled the purpose which is to point to Jesus Christ. And so if you were to miss it, the problem is not a miracle, the problem is you. Christ is that power behind that miracle. And that miracle is pointing to Christ who has that power that can save sinful men from the sin. Jesus is the only Savior of the world. No sinful man can be saved without him. And so when the, pe when the people heard, Peter spoke about Jesus Christ. They were not unfamiliar with who he was. But did they really know him? If they had truly known him or he, who he was truly, they would not have crucified him in the first place. And so they failed to identify him. And we look at how Peter used at least four different titles to depict the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and you can, you can see in verse 13, <clears throat> The middle part, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our father, had glorified his son, Jesus. He is God's son. And then in verse 14, But ye denied the Holy One. He is the Holy One. You cannot find a single sin on him. And he also the just. You have kept the law. You cannot convict him by any breaking of the law because he has kept the law. He is a just. He is the Holy One. And then lastly, in verse 15, and killed the Prince of Life. He is the Prince of Life. He is the source of life. He gives life. You believe him, you live. You refuse to believe him, you die. And so with this four description, they depict who Jesus really was. But did the people know him? Yes, they certainly saw him because they were the ones who crucified him. Well, they even chose Basabas, the murder murderer, over Jesus, even though Jesus had done nothing that deserved death at all. 
And they were all part of this multitude who cried, crucify him, crucify him. Are they not guilty? But it was only now. It was only now that they truly know him for who he really is. So by this time, their heart must be tricked by Peter's message. Peter's message was focused on Christ and his resurrection so that these Jews will look to him for salvation. Jesus is the one who healed this lame man so that through this miracle, sinful man may turn to Jesus for salvation. And to Christ, the scripture is fulfilled. The way in which Christ had to suffer, the way in, in which Christ is betrayed, and even to die, all these were prophesied by the prophets and all fulfilled in Jesus alone. God remembers his covenant. God remembers his promise to send the Messiah to save them. And in Christ is a fulfillment. Do you believe? And if you truly believe, what is your response? From verses 19 to 26. There is a right response expected of the people. All those who heard the message must respond. So let me read to you verses 19 to the end of the chapter. Verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sin may be brought out, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophet and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So all those who were found in the temple were the Jews. And as Jews, they were taught the scriptures. And so what Peter was telling them were not unknown to them. They knew the prophecies concerning the Messiah. And now that Christ is the fulfillment of the prophecies that link all that had happened before their eyes, they must need a right response from them. They cannot simply marvel at a miracle and go away without the right response and application. So what should be their response after hearing the message? Look at verse 19. Peter said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. For well, the word repent means to change one's mind. And so applying to salvation in Christ, this change is crucial. Without this change, there is no evidence of salvation at all. Only those who are saved will repent. Those who are not saved will never repent. They will not change their mind about Christ. 
and they will never submit themselves to his authority. And so repentance is important. If we have been convicted of our sin by the word of God, there is only one way out, and that is to repent. And then we also see the words, be converted. Now the word, be converted, means to turn from something bad, not something bad, to something good. That's how the word was used here, be converted. Oh, you have been sinning and rebelling against God. Just stop sinning. Just stop rebelling. Obey Him. Follow Him. Worship Him. Serve Him. Be converted. To so repent and be converted. That your sin may be brought out. But the idea here is one whose death was completely cancelled. Any trace of the dead in record is entirely removed. So when we are saved, we are forgiven of all our sin. Forgiven means completely forgiven. Not 99%, but 100%. And so here, the right response is repentance. By repentance, it means that they are not going to live as if the Messiah has not come. Or as if God's promise and, and covenant are not fulfilled yet. That would be the wrong focus. The Messiah has already come. The work of redemption is completed perfectly. And all these Jews in the temple have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ from the mouth of Peter. It is a gospel of salvation. It is a gospel of forgiveness, of sin, through the reason Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, they must focus on Him and Him alone. Now, we also see there is a reference to the time frame between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And we are living within that time frame now. Okay, so let me show to you. It is between the times of refreshing in verse 19 that we see the word time of refreshing all the way to verse 21 until the time of restitution of all things. Okay, so we are living between this period, the times of refreshing and the time of restitution. Okay, we are living in this period now. The first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And so as such, the Jews cannot be taking their own sweet time to repent. The presence of the Lord indicates the time of refreshing will already happening right now. And this is because Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah, has already come according to prophecy. And this is his first coming. But then the question we want to ask, why is his first coming called the time of refreshing? Refreshing means recovery. It is a spiritual recovery. It is the revival of the soul that have been lost. Now they are revived. The gospel of salvation fulfilled by Christ brought about the revival of the soul. And these are the times of refreshing. Christ, the living word, who had given us his written word, it makes the teaching of God's word come to life because it is a fulfillment of all the prophecies. It comes alive in the heart of all those who heard and believe. And those who heard him were, were completely satisfied. Their spiritual hunger were filled. Their spiritual thirst were quenched. So indeed, from his written word, 
the Lord Jesus has brought to us times of reflection. Thank God that his word is preserved perfectly today. We still need his word. People still need to know him through his word. However, not all will believe. Not all will seek after the truth. Not all will come to salvation. But God is long-suffering and not willing that any should perish. He is still waiting for those who are still outside his kingdom. He is still waiting for them to repent of their sins and come to Christ for salvation. But know this, the door of waiting, the door of grace will not be open forever. There will come a time that this door will be closed. And this time is described as the time of restitution. The word restitution gives the idea of restoring that which has been damaged. And then you restore it back to the original condition. That's the idea of restitution. Well, indeed, sin has caused much damage to this world. The root of all problems and troubles in this world can all be traced to sin. But when Christ returns, he will restore this physical earth to the original state. And then he will rule over the earth for a thousand years. And this is recorded in Revelation chapter 20. The time of restitution will happen by the second coming of Christ. Everything will be restored to what the world was like before sin entered into the world. The times of restitution will come one day. And when it comes, it will be too late for those who want to repent and cannot. Is there not an urgency right now? Because we do not know when these times of restitution will come. It may come suddenly. And when it comes, it is too late. And so there is great urgency to us who are living today. If we have truly believed in Christ for salvation, we must not delay believing in Him and following Him. We must not think that, oh, we can pursue the world first and then Christ later. Let me earn my keep first. Let me enjoy my life first. Only when I retire, only when I, I, I have exhausted my physical strength, which I cannot work anymore, then I come and believe in Christ. Can we do that? No. Because if we were to do that, what is your focus? Your focus is on physical need. No, our focus must be on our spiritual needs first. Our focus must be on Christ and no one else and nothing else. Not health and wealth first, then Christ. Or health and wealth together with Christ. No, only Christ and Him alone. Well, if health and wealth can bring us happiness and meaning in life, God will not have given us the promise of His Son. God would not have sent him to be the savior of the world. If health and wealth is the solution to our sin problem, then God would not have given us John 3.16. But because health and wealth cannot satisfy us, only Christ can satisfy us. That's why it's according to promise. Moses prophesied that God will raise up a prophet according to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. And Jesus is that prophet whom God has raised up. And those who hear him will live. But those who do not hear him will perish. 
and Christ is the seed of Abraham. And all those who trust in him will be blessed. This is God's promise. And so therefore we must focus on Christ. Let our spiritual need rise above our physical need. And so by focusing on Christ, it means how we ought to follow him faithfully. How we ought to do his will, not our will. It means that we are going to lead our family according to what he has commanded. It means that we are going to please him at home, in school, and also at our workplaces. And even if it, it is going to cost us our life, our job, our livelihood, our friend, we are to still focus on Christ. No matter what happens, we are not going to compromise our faith. We are going to focus on Him and please Him in all that we think, all that we say, and all that we do. Know the place of miracles. We believe God can still do miracles today. If He so desires, He is God. He is not limited by, by us. But he does not need a miracle worker to do his miracle today. His work is completed. All those signs and wonders and miracles that authenticated the apostles' preach, ministry of preaching, teaching, and writing to prove that they are indeed stand by God, all this power to do miracles had already passed away together with the apostles. Know the place of miracles. Then we will be able to have the right focus. Though God can still do miracles today, as He so will, do not focus on the miracles. Focus on Christ in which the miracles come. In fact, all of God's great work that are done in our life point to Christ and Him alone. So we need to focus on Christ. When we focus ourselves on Christ and Him alone, we will then conform to His image more and more. We want to obey Him. We want to please Him. We want to glorify Him. And so may God help us continue to press on and may we be found faithful when we see our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, face to face. Let us close in prayer. Let us. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy precious word. Forgive us, O Lord, how we have focused on all the wrong things and how we have loved the things of this world more than we love the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, O God, to remember thy word, that we may love thee, that we may give our life as living sacrifices, because thou hast saved us for thy use. Thou hast saved us for thy glory, and help us to know thee from thy precious word. So that from this life and in this life that thy name will be highly magnified and glorified. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will be a channel of blessing to all those around us, that they may see the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, that they may be drawn to him for salvation. How about, O oh God? And we commit all this with thanksgiving. Commit the rest of this lost day unto thy hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Till we meet again, thank you and God bless.